name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will trust my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, Jesus' name. I speak the name of all authority, declaring blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. He is greater, he is stronger, he's a God of possible. I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee. In Jesus' name, I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Oh. Come believe it, come receive it, oh power of the Spirit is now forever yours, come believe it, come receive it, in the mighty name of Jesus, all things are possible. Pray for your healing, circumstances would change. I pray that fear inside would flee, in Jesus' name. I pray for a breakthrough to happen today. Pray miracles over your life, in Jesus' name. I pray for revival, confession of faith. I pray that the dead would come alive in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Church, I'll bear with me a little bit this morning. I'm a, I'm a little nervous. Uh, uh, I've never been asked to go anywhere else to preach before. <laughs> I've always preached at, uh, at home, and uh, I'm not, I, I will be the first to tell you, I'm not worthy to get behind a pulpit. I'm not worthy enough to stand behind this sacred desk and spread the Word of God. But I'm thankful that God has called me to do what I do. Those that don't know me, my name is Cody. I'm the youth pastor at East Elkin Full Gospel Church. Uh, I've been for a little over three years. Um, uh, these are not my sons on the front pew, but I claim them as my sons. They're uh, my lovely nephews, and uh, they kind of just follow wherever I go. So I'm, I'm thankful they come with me this morning. Um, Y'all be much in prayer for the church. Uh, I announced to them Wednesday night that I wasn't going to be there today. And uh, those that know, I do our choir. I do our kids, I do the bulletins, I do worship, and a little bit of everything else, and children's church with them on Sunday mornings. Uh, I was deeving out my jobs on Wednesday night, and they looked at me like, Are you com you're coming back, right? And I said, I don't know, depends on if Doug keeps me. So, they're on to you, I'm just telling you, okay? All right, so y'all, uh, 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 I hope y'all get a blessing out of it this morning. I, I, one of my most favorite books of the Bible is the book of Revelation. 
that is my most favorite book of the Bible. I have searched and studied in it uh, for a very long time. And if you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask if you turn over to the book of Revelation in chapter number 3. And we're going to be on chapter number 3 and verse number 14. I'll give you a few moments to turn there. And when you find it this morning, if you will, say amen for me. First time I did it at the church, they didn't know what to do. They all kind of looked at me like deer in headlights, like, you just told me to speak. Yeah, speak. <laughs> uh, I, I like to hear people talking back to me. Right. Uh, when you're up here behind the pulpit, nobody's talking and nobody's saying amen. It's a little nerve-wracking, isn't it? All right, but in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, uh, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art rich and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chastise, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and he will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for allowing us to come back to your house just one more time, God. God, we ask, God, that everybody here, God, just get a special touch, God, from you, God. That when they leave here today, God, they're drinking from their saucer because their cup is overflowing, God. God, just bless the word, God, that I'll be obedient and obey thine will. In your most gracious and heavenly name, we do so humbly pray. And everybody said, Amen. Those that's not familiar with this particular part of Revelation, it is, this is the letter to the church of the Laodicean. When you study and read about Revelation, I, I, I walk while I talk, I can't be still. <laughs> uh, if you, <laughs> if you, um, Anybody that's ever studied Revelation, if you've ever dove de dug deep into Revelation and you've really studied what these letters mean, these letters de designate different time periods in history. Y'all looking at me like, really? Yeah, this Revelation, the book of prophecy that we're reading out of, was different time periods in history. It was a warning to that time period. It was a warning to those generations. Church, we're in the last letter. We are in the church of Laodicea. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who is the beginning of the creation of God? Jesus. Being the beginning of the creation of God means Jesus was the member of the Trinity who was the agent of creation. We know that in Genesis 1.1, what does it say, church? In the beginning God. God was all, God is all, and God will be all. God has never changed. God ain't ever going to change. God's the same today and yesterday and He'll be the same God tomorrow. Yeah. How do I know that? Because my Bible reminds me of that daily. Uh -huh. My Bible reminds me that my God doesn't change. No. People change. Uh -oh. The churches change. Uh -oh. Brother Doug, I remember a time at East Elk and there wasn't room to sit in pews on a Sunday morning. Now we get about 60. Half the church is full. Church, there used to be a time in my youth group I had a 30 children ranging from birth up until age 18 because that's what I deal with. I'm good to have 15 on a good day. 
People have used COVID as an excuse to get out of church. But like Brother said this morning, they wasn't rooted in the foundation, so they use it as an excuse and they didn't have to go back no more. When our church shut down back in 2020, when all the churches shut down back in 2020, we made a way for us to get together. We got through Zoom. Ain't technology good when it works? We got together on Zoom because the church said, if you can figure out a virtual way, we'll get together. Those same ones that were saying, Cody, find an option, never once darkened the virtual door of a church and haven't darkened the door of a church since. We have pathways. You can come physically. You can blog in through Facebook Live. You can log in through Zoom. I found out today that this goes on TV. I didn't know that till I got here today. That's another way you can, you can, you can get into church one way or another. But I'm going to tell you, there's no feeling like being inside of God's house on a Sunday morning. Amen. I like being with my brothers and sisters. I don't know how these people can go day in and day out and not go to church and not see their brothers and sisters. I need that special touch. I need that interaction with my family. Amen. The spiritual holiness of the church in Laodicea was nauseating to Christ. Our pastor, or your pastor Jerry talks about this a lot. That it says in 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would work cold or hot. He goes, you're not cold. You're not refreshing. You're not hot. You're not soothing. You're not anything. It says you're lukewarm. Church, we've all gotten lukewarm. I say this because I know it's true. Churches across America today have gotten so lukewarm, it ain't even funny anymore. We rather have a feel-good preacher. Church, I'm going to here to tell you right now, if you want a feel-good preacher, I advise you not to stay here and listen to me. I advise you to go back out that door and go find Joel Osteen. I'm not a feel-good preacher. I'm not here to boost your ego. I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. And I'm here to do what my God told me to do. My God told me I needed to warn His people. But He didn't just tell me to do that. He told you to do that too. It's in the book. It's in our sacred book to warn my people of their wicked ways. But we don't. Because we've gotten lazy. We've gotten lukewarm. We've decided we don't need to. I despise this phrase I'm fixing to say. I'm offended. Y'all know the phrase. I despise to hear anyone say, I'm offended. We have a name for those people. They're called snowflakes. We're in this current generation of snowflakes that gets so easily offended over everything that it's laughable anymore. We can't even have men and women because now people's offended. You call me a man, I'm a woman, and vice versa. No, what God assigns you at birth is what you are. I'm sorry you're offended of your own self. That's your problem, not mine. But the churches have allowed it to happen. That's it. Amen. I say this at my church and they look at me like, I did not. Yes, you did. Yes, we all have allowed it to happen. Yes, it started how many years ago when they took the Bible out of church? Who let it happen, church? Wow. We did. We let them take the Bible out. We let them take prayer out. And now we're letting the world take over. Come on. And pretty soon, church, we're going to be out. The trumpet's fixing to sound. God is fixing to send His Son out on that cloud to come get His church. And we got to be ready. But not only do we got to be ready, we got to make sure that our hands are clean. We got to make sure that the world's blood isn't on our hands because we decided we were too lukewarm to go and talk to somebody about God. Y'all got quiet. That's how I know it's effective. 16 says, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Church, I want you to think about if you was taking a drink. Think about this cup of water. Y'all give me water and it amuses me. I don't get this at church. Y'all gave me a cup of water. Sister, it's nice and cold. I thank you for it. 
I'm going I'm to drink it here shortly. But it's nice and cold. Who here has ever had hot water to drink? Just plain hot water. Kind of gross, right? Now, like if you add a tea bag to it, then that's acceptable. It tastes better. It's good for you. It soothes you. But think about this cup of water, and it turned lukewarm. It had been sitting for an hour. That's <laughs> what I would do. It's either got to be hot, it's either got to be scalding hot where it's going to burn my mouth, okay? Or it better be ice cold where my brain goes numb. One of the two. There's no in between. And that's what God just told us. He goes, there shouldn't be no in between. Right. It's either black or white. There's no gray zone. We have forgotten that as a church. This Bible is written in black and white. It's clear as day and clear as night, but we have let the world corrupt it. We have let the world corrupt the churches. Think about some churches that are in the community today. I don't know if y'all have the, the, these kind of churches up here like we do back, uh, back down the mountain because it's so far, I tell you. But those churches, they have the big stages. They have all the big productions. They have all the lights. They have the drums, the electric guitars. Everything's a performance. And it's all choreographed. They don't even have church hymnals in some churches anymore. It goes up on a screen. Church, I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing like picking up an old church hymnal and singing those hymns. Like the old-time religion song. It was good for our mothers. It was good for our fathers. It's good enough for me. It'll do when I'm dying. Amen? The same religion, the same God that saved my grandma is the same God that's still saving people today. God hadn't changed. God ain't left. We have got complacent. We've become lukewarm. And it says, he spews, I, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The church today has gotten too proud. Verse 17 says, Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. How many people here like to hear somebody brag on themselves? I'm so glad you're honest because I would have brought you down here real quick. I don't like to hear nobody brag. Amen? That's right. That's right. Come on. Amen. There we go. All right, y'all ain't asleep. I don't like to hear nobody brag. I like to hear th- good things that people done. But it's when they keep going. They want that satisfaction. They want that glory. They want that honor. They want that little gold star. I don't care if you got your little gold star. I don't care how good you are. Don't brag. Tell me you did it. That's awesome. Pat on the back. Let's go. Yeah. Come on. go but instead, the churches today, it's, well, look what my church did. Look how many people are in my church. Look how much offering my church took up today. Oh, this is my favorite. Look how much I pay my, or we pay our pastor to be our pastor. If the pastor is in it for the money, the pastor's in it for the wrong reason. Amen. The pastor shouldn't be in his position to get a paycheck. He's in his position because God called him. He's in his position because God led him to that church. And pastors don't retire. Do you know that? They might stop being ahead of the church, but they don't ever stop preaching the Word of God. And did you know that you're all, pastor, you're all called to preach the Word of God? Do we forget that? We forget that the Bible has told us that God has called us to spread His Word. We are the hands and feet of God. But we, get, we, haven't, we ain't doing it. I have this discussion with my kids a lot. I don't sugarcoat it with my kids either, do I, youngins? Nope. I don't sugarcoat it with my boys. I don't sugarcoat it with my youth department. I don't sugarcoat it. We've gotten lazy. We're too worried about what other people have to think about us. I have said this numerous times and I'll say it again. I don't care what anybody thinks of me because God's opinion is the only one that matters. The world, I'm going to tell you up front, the world hates you. Want to know why the world hates you? Because you're here today. If you aren't here today or logged in online with us today, 
If you're ignoring being assembling yourself together, like the Bible tells us to, if you decided not to get together in some form of fashion with the church, you're letting the devil win. If the devil's not on your case every single day of your life, then that means the devil's already got you, honey. The kids look at me when I say that like, well, why would the devil... Why would, why, what do you mean by that? Well, when you start living like the world, when you start dressing like the world, when you start talking like the world, the devil has you. He's not going to be on your shoulder. He's not going to say, you need to do this, you need to do that. When the devil stops bugging you is when you need to hit the altar. Because that means the devil has you and you're in a lot of trouble. None of us want to be in trouble, right? Who here has ever been to the woodshed? I like... There you go. Some, some were honest, some were not. I'll deal with you after church. I've been to the woodshed more times than I can ever care to admit. Amen. But I will be the first to tell you I was not spanked enough as a child. Ain't that right, honey? That's right. <laughs> Me and Des have been married for almost two, almost two years. be two years in July. And uh, she's learned I was not spanked enough as a child. <laughs> We've gotten away from our chastisement. When the Lord comes to us and says, you shouldn't be doing this, we turn that blinded eye to Him. We don't want to listen when someone tells us we're wrong because we live in a world that says we can have it all. You're always right. Someone's got to be wrong somewhere. Just like in schools, someone's got to lose. In sports, everybody gets a trophy. Someone's got to lose. That's how the world works. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He said, you're so arrogant of your own selves, you don't even know what you really are. You don't see how miserable you actually are. You don't see how far the devil has his hooks in you. You don't see how miserable you're being to other people. You don't see how much other blood's on your hands because of what you've said or done. And because of that, I spew you out. In 19, uh, verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. He says, you know what? I love all. I love everybody. I love all humans. Well, Cody, he can't love the gays. He loves the gays. He doesn't love their ways. And some churches you go to, well, he can't like people from this orientation or this descent or this country. Does my Bible say he don't like Asians or uh, he don't like Jewish people? He don't like this and that. What's what, does your Bible say that? Because if it does, we need to have a talk. The Bible says he loves all, and because he loves all, we're supposed to love all. But how quick are we when we see that the sin that we don't like? We start to judge that person. I'm going to come down here. I don't like being so tall. We start to judge that person. Who's the judge? I can assure you that it's none of us. I'm not a judge. Pastor Doug's not a judge. None of you are judges. We don't have a right to judge a soul. But every day that we go through life, we're judging somebody for everything they do. I'll come back over here, sister. We're not to judge. We're not the judge. We didn't write the book, did we? We've never seen God's face, have we? We even made us a glory yet. We're trying every day. How does the world view Christians? I'm going to echo again. The world views us as somebody, that, as people, Christians are hated. Because we don't love people like we, like we preach we do. We don't accept people like we preach we do. We don't allow this. We don't allow that. Okay, well there's some things that I'm not going to allow. 
In the United Methodist Church, this has been a very hot topic and I've been reading on Facebook, a lot of your United Methodist churches have left the United Methodist Church organization. Well, why? Because the United Methodist Church started allowing gays behind the sacred desk. They all started allowing sin to take over their churches. So the churches are finally standing up and told the United Methodist Church organization, we're not having any part of it. And they went back and they started a new organization, the Global Methodist Church, GMC. When I first thought of it, I saw a truck. But what GMC is what the, the churches are doing. And they're going back to the Bible foundation. They're reminding people what it means to be a Christian. They're getting sin out of their churches. And you know what? They're being condemned, but they're happier than ever. They're seeing souls saved when they hadn't seen souls saved in years because they got sin out of the church. Church, when you bring sin in, the church can't grow. The church can't thrive. You might as well hang a wreath on the door, lock it up, and walk away from it. This is a sacred house of God. This is a sacred house, and sin isn't allowed in it. I like this next part. 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm just going to focus on that a second. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How many of you let him in? Hmm? How many of us actually let him in when he's knocking? Who remembers the day they got saved? That is one day I will never forget in all of my life. I can take you to the place. I can tell you who was preaching. I might not can tell you who was around me at the time, but I can take you to the place. I can tell you where I got saved. I can tell you where I knew that I was a sinner and my God was going to save me. All thing I had to do was say, God, I'm sorry, have me. Have your way with me. Use me, mold me, guide me, direct me. But we're too proud today to say that. The people that were saved when they were young, I, they're some of the ones that don't even come to church no more. As a youth pastor, I like to see a child saved. And I will do everything in my power to keep that child in church. But as they get older... That world comes in. And that's when you see a falling away of this generation. They're not rooted like they think they are. They can listen to me and I can preach to them and teach to them and it'll go in one ear and right back out the other. Sometimes I want to go up to them and hold my hand right here so I get stopped for just a hot second anyway. Parents, grandparents, how many times have y'all ever had to do that to your kids, your grandkids? You're sitting there talking to them dead in the face and you think what you're saying is clicking and then you ask them a question to follow up and it's not there. My boys do that to me sometimes. Except the tiny one. I'm going to pick on little Caden. I'm going to visit with you just a second. My little Caden, he, he, he turns 11 tomorrow. So as we leave today, y'all give him a good spank. He turns 11 tomorrow. He is our little, he, we call him our little genius. Uh, that's not what I call him. I call him my retirement plan. Amen. <laughs> little Caden is very smart. Little Caden remembers things that Uncle Coco didn't remember saying. Man, how many times have we said something that we don't remember saying, but our wives remember it for us? Amen. All the time. Amen. I didn't know how much I forgot till I got married. I forgot a lot, apparently. But behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Did he specify who he was knocking on the door of? What's it say? If any man... Does that mean just men? No, thank you. I have a lot of people that like to argue with me that the Bible is sexist. That's another one. Behold, I send the door and knock if any man hear my voice. Any man. 
man, woman, child, black, white, yellow, polka dotted, God doesn't care. He loves you all the same. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He is knocking on so many churches' doors and the churches won't let Him in anymore. In high school, I was in show choir for three years. And I visited 50 churches every year to perform in. Now, there were some churches that you could feel the Spirit, you could feel the anointing of the congregation. You knew God frequented that church. And then there were some church... Ooh, Lord. I'm not sure why I was there. I'm not sure why they had church written on their building. Because they were far from it. Because they're not listening to the call. Church, like I told you at the very beginning of, uh, of this morning, this is the last letter that was written as a warning to the churches. This is the last layer, letter. We are the church of Laodicea. I have some people that think, we still got time. Church, you're not promised the next heartbeat. You're not promised to step outside of those church doors. You're not promised to hear the ending of my sermon. I'm not promised to finish my sermon. The Bible says, and Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. And, it's, and He goes on to say that no man except the Father knoweth the time. Not even Jesus Himself knows. Only the Father knows. And me and Pastor and uh, Kelly, we all use this, uh, this uh, illustration that Jesus is standing there on the edge of a cloud and He's just rearing back and He's just waiting for God to say, Go. And what a day that'll be. Oh, I love that song, don't y'all? What a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see. Church, are you going to meet Him? Or are you going to fall short? We're still in this flesh. Some of us, like myself, have a lot more flesh than others. But we're still in this flesh. And because we're in this flesh, there's still sin opportunity. The Bible tells us that we die daily. We wake up every morning as a new creature in Christ. We get a new opportunity every day to spread His Word, to spread His light, to be a soldier for God. At the first of the month, no, yeah, well, a couple weeks ago, uh, we had a lock-in for my youth department. All of our kids were there. And I gave them a hint before we got ready for lock-in because I had to forewarn the parents. I said, we're going to have a funeral and we're going to have a burial. Teresa asked me if I was sacrificing Noah. I had to ensure her I wasn't. But that's all I would tell them. We're going to have a funeral and we're going to have a burial. So about 11.30, I gave all the kids a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper was two very wonderfully drawn people that I created because I can draw. But I gave it to them and I said, on one of them, I want you to draw yourself and I want you to put yourself in funeral clothes. I want you to make yourself look good. I said, then on this other one, I want you to write down negative things that you don't like about yourself, things that you wish you could take back, things you wish you could be forgiven for, but you're not sure if you're forgiven for. I said, I want you to write it down. I said, once you do that, we're going to cut them out we're going to put them together. And then at the strike of midnight, I brought all of them outside. And I had three big things of dirt ready. I even brought... I, I played this up now. I brought out a podium outside and they had to get up and they had to give their own eulogy. Oh, right? That was some of the parents' reactions. They had to give up. They had to give a eulogy. And then I gave them a plastic bag, which was our coffin. So they put their person inside their coffin and then they had to bury themselves. Before we started, I read to them where it says that we die daily. We die, we shed that old man. When we accept Christ Jesus, we rise up a new creature. We rise up and we take on the form that God wants us to take on. 
All that negativity that we have, all those burdens that we carry, the things that we wish we could change, we can do that if we just give it to God. And what I told them before we started our funeral, I said what you're going to do is everything that you have written down in your person, you're going to bury it. And then we're going to pray after everybody's done each of their eulogies. I said, and whatever you wrote down, you don't carry away from, with you once we leave this place. I said, you're going to leave it in the ground and God's going to take care of every bit of it. There was one child. He absolutely broke my heart. He doesn't know it. On the outside, he had himself all decorated nice and pretty. And on the other one, we noticed he had really just went to town on his other person. Really making it dark. Who here has ever watched uh, Venom and Spider-Man? Who, who, okay, let me rephrase it. Who knows who Venom is? No, okay. Venom is Spider-Man's uniform, but he's completely black. So that's basically what this young man drew on his other one. And I went up to him, I said... What, is, what, what, is, what does this mean? And he goes, I have too much darkness. He said, no one can ever love me. I said, that ain't true. I said, because I love you. I said, but most of all, God loves you. I said, and when you bury that today, I said, you don't ever think that about yourself ever again. When sister here is talking about the kids, we gotta, we got to really pray for our kids. We, we, we now live in a world where suicide is higher than ever. Amen. And that's among high schoolers. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't pay me enough to go back to high school today. The world that they live in is nothing like what I left behind. And I've only been graduated 12 years. No. Yeah. Twelve years. I pray for each one of my kids daily. I call them out by name. Amen. I pray for their schools. Yes. Because not even a couple weeks ago, closest to my, my middle nephew there, there was a drive-by shooting while they were at school. And his school had to go on lockdown. A friend that I work with, they had a shooting on school campus. In Texas. I want you to stop and think about that just a second. What has the world come to? We've allowed these kids to get out of church. As sister over here said, we forgot to, let, we forgot to give them the baton. I'm so thankful that even though my mother didn't go to church when I was little, my grandma did. And my grandma drug me to church every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday. And any time there was Bible school or revival or any type of fish fry... I love a good fish fry now. I was there. Did I always want to be there? Maybe not. But my grandma made sure I was. Amen. And as a child, I prayed and I begged and I pleaded with God, please, don't let my mama go to hell. I need my mama. Please don't let my mama go to hell. End of 2018. My mama came to church. And she got her life right with God. It took, I was five years old when I started praying for my mama. I'm almost 30 now. God will answer your prayers, but it's in God's time. It's not in your time. I have a very favorite verse in the Bible. Caden Lee, please tell the church what my favorite verse is. Be still, Be still and know that I am God. I use favorite verse very loosely. As you have noticed, I don't stand still. I don't like it when someone tells me to be still. I don't like it when someone tells me to sit down. 
obviously. Do you know how many times in the almost two years that Des and I have been married that that verse keeps coming up every time we pray for a kid, every time we pray, for, uh, pray to get a house, every time our cars break down? Do you know how many times that verse pops up? Every time we don't want it, that verse pops up. It is. I have that verse on coasters in my house. I have two or three pictures that hang in my house that say it. And at our church on Sundays, the kids have to do Bible verses every Sunday. So I bring them up, and they get up here where I'm at, and they will tell their Bible verse. And what is their favorite thing to do? Look at me while they say, Be still and know that I'm God. And they'll smile and walk off. I love my kids. Sometimes I have to remind myself of that. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Church, God is knocking on every one of our church doors today. God is knocking on every one of our hearts today. The only thing He wants us to do is read the Word. The only thing He wants us to do is share the Word. Be the hands, be the feet. Be what we claim to be. We claim to be Christians. What is the definition of Christian? Christ-like. There we go. Y'all got quiet like, I don't know if I should say it. Christ-like. We say we're Christians, which means we're saying we're Christ-like. But are we living it? Are we showing it? I'm going to share this little story with you before in my closing. My middle brother, he's in his mid-twenties, decided right after Christmas he was no longer my brother. He is now my sister. So being, with that being said, I had a lot of hate in my heart for my brother. I don't, it's like I told him, I said, I don't care what you think you are or who you tell the world you are. God made you a man. You've been my brother for almost 30 years. You are my brother. I have a lot of hate and I have a lot of resentment against my brother because of the way that he is done. He was a group in church just like I was, and he even went with his dad to church. And it's that generation thing. They think they're owed it. They think that the Bible's a mistake. They think that us getting together on Sundays is a mistake. I'm here to tell you that being a Christian isn't a mistake. Amen. And if you feel the need to change your gender, God don't make junk. That's right. God don't mess up. Uh-huh. God made you in His image. Uh-huh. When I ask the kids this, and I like to ask them this from time to time, have you ever seen the face of God? I asked y'all this too. And they look at me, well, no, we've never seen the face of God. I said, I need you to look in the mirror. Because when you look in the mirror, you're looking on God's face because you're made in His image. We are the face, the hands, the feet of God. Are we living it? God's knocking today. Are you going to open the door? It's time that we start acting like a church. He's fixing to come back. And it's not going to be when you're sitting in a church pew. I strongly believe that that God ain't going to come back while we're sitting in church. He's going to wait to the moment you least expect it. Where are you going to go? Are you going to answer the knock? Or are you going to let the knock pass you by? Pastor. Lord, we so needed this word. God, I pray that you stir us right down all the way to the very bottom and the depths of our soul this morning. Search me, O oh God, and know me this morning. My heart and my life, God, I don't want to be lukewarm. I pray, God, that you send a revival in our midst, Lord. 
hearts and souls will be stirred and moved. Why are you standing here this morning? doesn't matter that you've been in church all your life. doesn't matter that you've been